or let me say the context of the video with an interesting stat. This year, we have around 90 people that have joined the 100x school. And this is what they learned in the first two months, HTML, CSS and JavaScript. This is what they learned in the next two months, which was the real intense period, HTTP, Express, MongoDB and WebSockets. And in their final end SEM that happened two days ago, amongst the 80 test cases that they were supposed to pass in an assignment, only one person was able to solve more than 50 test cases. Only five people were able to solve more than 20 test cases. And only 10 people solved at least one test case. No one else was able to solve even a single test case. That's primarily how the engineering market is looking right now. Less than 5-10% of the people are actually able to do real world tasks. And if you want to check the assignment out, you can check the end term examination and the tests linked in the description. You can test yourself uh, where you probably stand. Uh, how you would have performed, you know, in a real world scenario, if you've been coding for six months, were you, would you be able to code yourself without using AI in a two and a half hour intense examination? Here is another interesting stat. Here is some code someone wrote, uh, who's from a very intense program of ours called Super 30. Uh, he was sitting for an interview for a 10 LPA job. And this is an, a question that I asked him to create a simple sign up endpoint. There are three big problems here. I'll ask you to figure those out and I'll probably tell the solution in the end. But this also was a failed interview, even though the person on paper looked really good. This takes me to the context for the video, which takes me to the title of today's video. Coding isn't really hard. It's just really hard to be accountable and keep showing up every day. Keep preparing for that final interview day. Keep building muscle memory so that if and when you do get an interview, you don't screw it up. This video is going to be divided into four parts. The current position of 90% of engineering graduates in the country. The right mindset to keep in case you do want to get a job in tech today what it actually takes to be in the top 5%. And lastly, a few personal icks that I have as I interview more than three, 400 people, trying to get them jobs or just figuring out if they're eligible or not. What are the things to keep in mind if you're ever sitting for an interview? With that, let's get into it. I've personally interacted with around 400 people in close one-to-one -one interviews, and there are clear categories that I can see people fall into. The biggest category is the category of pretenders. These are people who love the sound of calling themselves developers, yet hate the journey that it takes to become a good one. They love telling people they're a full stack developer or they're good at AI. They love posting screenshots of, you know, courses and progresses. But when it's really time to sit down, go in the depth of a technology, they find something new and flashy to jump onto. This is really dangerous because they're not just fooling others, they're fooling themselves. Deep inside, they know they don't have depth. And when the reality does hit them when they actually give an interview, it leads to a lot of lack of self-confidence, a lot of insecurity, a, a lot of leaving tech, a lot of tweeting about tech is not the right industry. And, you know, there are no jobs in the industry right now. So I say this very honestly, if you are picking a course, commit to it. If you are doing an engineering degree, commit to showing up every day. Don't brag about learning something when you actually don't understand it in depth. If you actually know a technology, your code will speak for itself or people would just know by talking to you. It's real irritating to have a persona about someone based on their projects, they know a few things and then them just fumbling the interview, you know, two minutes down the line. Practice until you feel like you can do this in your sleep. Post to the pretenders, there is the second category of people who are not from a CS background. There are a lot of times from commerce, art, civil, other branches of engineering. When they enter coding, uh, and you might feel this as well. It feels like AI is everywhere and it's probably going to replace your jobs in the next one year, two year, three years, or it can do a lot of things that were really hard to do a few years ago. So they feel like quitting. It feels like it's a diminishing market right now and you know, it'll probably only get worse over time, which I think is a debatable statement. But generally, if you're showing up, if you're not pretending, you only have to compete with like five out of 100 people. That's not very hard to do if you're an accountable and motivated person, irrespective of your background, be it CS or non-CS. Give yourself six to eight months, eight hours a day, no shortcuts, no hacks, only deep efforts. That would build a foundation that would probably carry for life. You have at least 30 to 40 years of a career. If all you have to do is give up six months, I think it's a pretty easy sacrifice to make. Generally, either put in a hundred percent or don't start at all. Tech is extremely meritorious right now. So unless you like coding, unless you can put in eight hours a day without feeling overworked, most probably you're not going to succeed in the long term. With that, let's move on to the second point, the mindset that you need to reach the top 5%. This part is mostly emotional, psychological and strategic. There's less IQ needed in this point and more accountability. As an early engineer, if you've just graduated, it feels like your first offer you need to highly optimize for. I don't think that's true. If you're lucky, I think if you're lucky or if you're in a tier one college, usually aiming for 30, 40 LPA is not bad. Most probably you're getting hired based on your IQ. Uh, most probably they're not even asking you deep questions. It's mostly a bunch of puzzles and data such as an algorithms based on which you'll get a job and probably a very lucrative job. This is because companies are okay hiring expensive talent from tier one colleges because in two years when the expensive talent with high iq actually understands the company they'll become a 
cheaper resource because their high iq will translate to the company resources and you know um, they'll be able to contribute at a much bigger level than maybe even an experienced engineer that's why itns are you know given out once year offers sometimes purely based on their iq skills dsa things like these and not necessarily their cs fundamentals the problem is i think probability clearly states that you know less than 0.1% of the people are able to reach iits so if you're in the other category it's not the best to optimize for similar offers it's not necessary that if you didn't get into an it you don't have a high iq or company shouldn't value you but unfortunately companies don't have the time or the energy to find that right person amongst you know thousands of engineering graduates so they will not have similar entry criteria for you or compensation office for you as you know a tier one college student it's something pretty simple and honest to understand which is reaching a company and getting a tech job is the first milestone and not the final lp offer that you got um, if you're getting an 8 to 10 lp offer on site or if you're getting a 12 to 14 lp offer remote i think it's a pretty decent offer to take when i graduated from an iit on a day one offer what would hit my bank account would be you know 1.3 lakhs a month if you're making 10 lpa your what's hitting is 80000 a month that's a 50000 gap that's very easily closable especially if you're competing with me because i was not interested at all in finance which is the company that i ended up joining so you would have caught up to me really quickly if you were actually providing good value to the company in a year or two you would have probably caught up to me so you can actually catch up you might not start at the same point as someone from a tier one college do not over optimize for that initial offer a lot of people i know are good friends and you know old students of mine are struggling really bad with this i'll take one such example i'll take one small example of a student like this who i referred to a friend ki yaar iski kisi tarike se naukri lagwa do he's been trying for a while and that friend told him ki i'm there is this offer it's i think it was 14 lpa and you know it is on site but i think i can get you this offer and his reply was nee i think i need 5 lakhs per month because the person that was referring him made probably you know it makes a lot of money so he felt like he probably play a hand and you know ask for 5 lakhs a month which is nowhere close to you know what he could realistically get right now um, versus if he would have just taken the 14 lpa offer he would have been employed for the last two months and maybe in a year he might have reached you know 18 lpa maybe he would have switched and gotten more but he would be actively providing value rather than you know building projects on his own and hoping for a 5 lakhs per month offer that most probably will not come without you know some industry experience money follows value and value usually follows experience the more on ground experience you have the more you've made your hands dirty with a specific tech stack the higher is the probability of you providing value to a company the higher is the probability of you making more money your vision shouldn't be i want a 30 lp offer it should be i need to join a strong engineering team that of course pays me decently well and i'll build my fundamentals so well in the next 2 3 years ki i'll be at the top of the pyramid and it'll be easy for me to negotiate whatever you want but at that point you'll probably not care about money uh, and you know you'll probably care more about the kind of work that you're getting which takes us to the third point which is what it actually takes what's the simplest thing that you need to do right now for the next 6 months and the simplest things that you need to avoid to be able to become a good developer to be in the top 5% and the solution starts with the problem the problem is you probably want everything very quickly everyone wants hacks everyone wants ai to write their code everyone feels ai can probably write code better than them but these hacks and shortcuts usually destroy careers very quickly if you are lying on shortcuts you'll never build muscle memory you'll never build first principles thinking there are a lot of common patterns and errors that you're going to go through as you code things yourself as you're solving issues in a company and your brain sort of learns to fix them faster and faster over time if you look at the example over here where i asked someone to code a simple sign up endpoint and he made three mistakes over here it would have almost been muscle memory for me to fix them i would have probably not made these mistakes in the first place if or if i'm ever shown this code i know three obvious things or five obvious things that i can fix over here number 1 you don't need to put user interface over here when it, when you clearly already know it's an interface Number two, usually when you're putting something in a database, everything should have a unique ID. Number three, the variable name here is incorrect. These are real mistakes that that person made during the interview. I have coded this sign up endpoint at least a hundred times by this point in my life. If I code this myself, if I don't use AI to code this, it's probably not going to change my muscle or how I understand this code much. But if I was writing the same code in Ruby on Rails or PHP, if I'm writing AI to use it, I'm not learning anything. I am not understanding these patterns that should be obvious to me if I've written this code myself over time. the path is pretty simple if you actually like building full stack projects if you've been taught web sockets at least that happened for me as soon as i was taught web sockets i built a chess multiplayer game myself back in 2014 which is the first time i was you know learning to code i was curiously trying to pick problem statements that would challenge me in a specific technology or tech stack or protocol uh, so that and not with any gorgeous aim of you know i want to be a good developer with muscle memory so let me just learn web sockets practically through examples it was just something that interested me if you can build that if you can find some level of curiosity then this journey becomes a little easier of you know coding things yourself and you know wanting to train your weights that exist in your brain to see these patterns again and again 
partially coding, providing value to a company or even interviews are just finding these patterns or knowing these patterns um, and probably not cramming them, but showing that you know these patterns experientially because you've coded these things again and again. In hindsight, this is obvious advice. If you do something a hundred times, the hundred and first time it will be very easy for you to do. The problem is the first hundred times has become so easy now that no one really wants to challenge their brain or, you know, change the weights in their brain to recognize these patterns. And it's just very easy for us to press a button for AI to code it for us. It's a fairly debatable statement if this is good or bad. A lot of people say if AI is present, why do you even need to learn these things? If there is a calculator, why do you need to do math in your head? Uh, but I think, but I think again, the only answer over there is what people are optimizing for when they're hiring is how well does this person know coding? But again, the answer over there is experience or hands-on experience of writing something sort of shows up. And unfortunately, that's what company and unfortunately that's what companies are optimizing for. And hence, you have to build that muscle by coding manually yourself again and again over time. The one place AI becomes helpful is it's a good tutor now, but unfortunately, you know, most people don't use it as a good tutor. Most people use it as a good slave uh, to do a bunch of their tasks for them. You've seen my roadmaps. You've seen various videos. Here are four detailed roadmaps with syllabus on AI, full stack, Web3 and DevOps. All of this is not rocket science. You don't have to clear JE uh, or sit in an examination. The problem is not intelligence. It's consistency. It's really hard to build today uh, because there are too many distractions. But the ones who succeed will not be the smartest. They'll be the ones who are, you know, working the most hard. Again, very obvious advice in hindsight. They're the ones who are going to just, you know, stick and show up every day. And that's really all it takes to, you know, become a good developer. Other than that, there are like auxiliary factors, the kind of company that you ended up joining for the first. Other than that, there are auxiliary factors, the kind of company that you ended up joining, the kind of team that you got, the kind of work that you've been is it challenging or not? And is the skill that you're learning replicable outside of your company or not? These are secondary factors. The primary factor is people need to hire and pay someone to, you know, offload their work to. You need to learn these things well. That will probably only happen if you're learning these things the difficult way and not the easy way. That takes me to the last point, which are some common icks that, you know, problems that I see with the first 90% of people who I interview, you know, one-on-one -on -one before I'm referring them or generally if, you know, I'm hiring for myself. Can I know this? Number one, it's very simple, which is, you know, if I ask them a question, they're like, ah, this WebSocket, for example, they're like, ah, this, I know I can probably do this, uh, not right now in the interview, but you know, if you give me AI and, you know, a bunch of tools, I'll be able to figure this out, which is great. Uh, but again, in the interview, what, what's needed is experiential learning. Are you already experienced in this stack or not? But Rakirat, as a fresher, I need to be experienced in a stack. Yes. Two years ago, hiring was different. Um, benchmarks were different. What was needed from a developer was different. Today, the bar is a little different and it'll be very different two years from now. So yes, you need to hit the ground running from day zero. Yes, you need to know things as you know, someone who's been coding for a year or two before you apply for a job, you unfortunately will either get a very cheap internship or you will not get a job at all. Uh, if you don't have experiential learning, which means, you know, a bunch of hands-on coding and, you know, seeing day-to-day -day challenges of system that are being used by users or, you know, are hitting production. Number two, I can quickly learn this in two days. So if there's a job opening that's coming, let's say it's in fast API and, you know, the one message I might get from someone is, I don't know this right now, but give me two days, I'll learn it. Again, that you can't have experiential learning in two days. If you've been coding 20 projects in fast API for a freelance client, for a friend, for yourself, uh, then yes, the experiential learning would just show. For the interview, you should just show up. There's no prep that needs to happen for a coding interview. I think that might be true for a Viva in school or, you know, whatever. JE prep, you prep for two, two years uh, or, you know, you do last day, 30 minute or 30 day preparation cycles, things like these. It doesn't really carry out to coding. Your experience will just show up and, you know, usually the best interviews are the interviews which are super candid about the person's experience, what they've been doing and, you know, does that experience apply very well to what we need? Is it relevant to the current job opening? A lot of times when people fail interviews, a common answer is I got nervous during the interview. Unfortunately, you're going to have limited set of interviews. And if this is going to be an answer, it's not a good answer. There's something just you, you need to fix yourself and, you know, not have jitters during an interview. Most of you will not have jitters. If you're just being candid, every time I've given an interview after two years of experience, I've been super candid about what I know and what I don't know. Uh, and if I know the answer and if I don't know the answer, and thankfully, a lot of times I've have been more knowledgeable than the interviewer themselves. So I've been super confident, you know, 10 minutes into the interview. 10 minutes into the interview, I've, I know, okay, I probably know more than this guy. Uh, so I, I've been, you know, super chill during, during the interview. Uh, that'll only happen if you're good. You'll only be good if you build muscle memory. So do that. Why do I need to code without an AI in an interview when, you know, AI can do everything. I'll use AI in my job. So I should probably be interviewed using AI. Again, it's debatable. Some people probably would allow this. There are a bunch of open book tests that happen as well. But again, the bar is really high in that case. Um, we, the examination that I was talking about, there was no AI allowed and hence, you know, five test cases was, or 10 test cases was a decent benchmark. If you were able to do that without AI in two and a half hours as someone who's 18 years old, just started coding, you know, five months ago, I think that's pretty good. If we did flip on AI over here, then, you know, the expectations would be something else. Amongst 80, you'd probably be expected to solve 75 test cases because the first 70 would be solved by AI. And, you know, you were really optimizing for the last five test cases. So some people are okay with an AI in an interview. I personally interview without an AI. And, you know, the benchmarks would be different based on if AI is enabled or not. The other one is, you know, keeping expectations constant. If you've asked a company or if a company has a benchmark of 10 LP and you 
crack interviews really well in that company don't overplay your hand uh, towards the end if you ask them for 10 lp initially you probably stick to that remote versus onsite is a big challenge i don't know who glamorized remote jobs i don't know who's to blame for that but i don't think initially it matters i mean it does matter i mean i get it remote work is cool you can work from anywhere you can moonlight as a company it's really irritating unfortunately the this is not 2020 where remote jobs were cool even for companies and you know because of covid or other factors you know it felt like you could ta hire talent from anywhere and you know they were borderless hiring and you could make a lot of money from india you know as a remote developer uh, that's still true but not something to optimize for again it's only for you know a certain percentage probably the top you know, xyz percent uh, and again heavily based on skills if you have extraordinary skills in a specific niche yes i think any company would be okay giving you whatever perk you want or whatever comp you want but that doesn't really apply very well early in your career that may or may not be too good in early in your career as well if you're not working closely with you know, you know smart people and teams and if you're not being half the job initially in your career should be you know to extract as much value as you can from senior engineers which is why i also say if you're joining a company maybe optimize for a company where you have someone to you know lead you guide you you will not get a lot of that if you're remote so just keep that in mind uh, whenever you're optimizing for these offers optimizing like and lastly optimizing like this is your last offer you will have many offers in your life i think most people probably change time companies during their career don't optimize too much before your first offer just get into the industry as quickly as possible maybe optimize for the team if you're getting a great engineering team and and the offer is less i think it's fine it's probably better than you know more comp less talent in the team but other than that i don't think there's much to optimize for in a tech job and two to three years in i think you get a lot of leverage in tech you don't get the leverage early now so just keep that in mind if you're an early engineer you need those years of experience to have leverage it's very close to how you know the doctor cycle works you have to do bachelor's and master's and probably another degree before you're extremely respected and you know you can command whatever salary you want at that point something similar over here but in this case you have to do four years of a degree followed by probably two years of work x at which point you know you have extreme leverage so i just keep the longer picture in mind rather than optimizing for extreme short term right now hopefully you learned something new and hopefully i was able to explain it's not very hard reaching that top 5% or you know high level position purely because I think most people are just focusing on the wrong things with that we'll end it I'll see you in the next one bye bye